Well, good morning. Today, I'm sharing with you a passage that I have probably preached multiple times to many of you. Uh, for some of you, you're going to think this is the only uh, sermon or passage I ever speak on. And I don't know why, but God keeps bringing me back to it. And every time I circle back, I learn something new. And I really believe that God has uh, laid on my heart today uh, something regarding the Messianic Son of Man that um, some of you may, f may find encouraging and motivating and perhaps even uh, challenging. When, when Pastor Steve and I spoke about uh, this particular uh, message uh, opportunity and that I would be uh, speaking in, in his place, <clears throat> he shared with me that, uh, that he had actually mentioned uh, the Son of Man in, in one of his messages and just alluded to the fact that it's a Messianic title. And last week I started a, a new series in Power to Stand on the book of Ezekiel in which the title Son of Man is used more often than in any other single book. And that title of, you know, of Ezekiel being the Son of Man, he is a, um, a, a foreshadowing or a picture uh, of, of Jesus Christ as, as one of the, the Old Testament prophets. And so it was uh, decided and determined that I would do a message on the Messianic uh, Son of Man. And as I studied for it and prepared, um, instead of looking at the 80 references in the Gospels in which Jesus uses this phrase for himself, uh, I thought it might be <clears throat> more prudent for me to select a portion of those so I wouldn't have to speak quite so fast and you wouldn't have to turn quite so many pages. But rather what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a thematic presentation, thematic presentation of the Messianic Son of Man. Now, just by way of introduction, and, and this is my first introduction, and then there will be a second introduction, <laughs> and then there will be a main part of the message, and I'll try to remember to share the, those things with you as I go. But the first introduction has to do with the concept of the Son of Man. In the Bible, when you see the, you know, the phrase, the Son of, you know, that's, a, that's a linguistic marker. And and, and in the culture of the day, to be the son of someone meant to be marked by their characteristics or perhaps even their character. So with the phrase son of God, we understand that to be a reference to Christ's deity. He is God in human flesh. He, he is the second person of the triune Godhead. Even before he took on human flesh, he existed in eternity past as the eternal Son of God. Now when we see the, the title Son of Man being applied to Jesus Christ, more often than not, it's explained that it's referring to his humanity. And while that is true, that's not all it refers to. While it does emphasize that he, that he became a man, that he is the God-man, that he is fully God and fully man, there's also a messianic component to that title. Now, some and perhaps many of you already know that the title Son of Man was the title of choice of, of Jesus Christ when he spoke of himself in the third person. He referred to himself as the Son of Man far more times than any other title. And as we, as we take a look at some of those references and connect it back to Daniel chapter 7, which is where it all begins, I think you'll 
you'll be able to catch uh, 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 at least an understanding that Son of Man means that, yes, Jesus Christ is fully man, but He's also the Messianic Son of God who has been chosen and selected by God the Father to rule and reign in His kingdom. So that was the initial introduction. On to introduction number two. The Messianic Son of Man. And we're going to start our journey in the second introduction in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing, and coming out from before him, thousands upon thousands were attending him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were open. As I mentioned in the call to worship this morning, this is a courtroom of heaven scene. And the setting is the end of days. And it has to do with a vision that Daniel had in Daniel chapter 7, in which he had a vision of seven world Gentile empires that, that paralleled the, the four Gentile uh, world empires that Nebuchadnezzar had in his vision in, in Daniel chapter 2. But whereas Nebuchadnezzar saw this magnificent statue made of various metals, impressive statue, Daniel saw four wild, terrifying beasts. And out of that fourth beast came a particular character that has a big mouth. He's referred to in chapter 7 as the little horn. We know him by many t titles in the Bible. The son of perdition, the man of lawlessness, the man of sin. He's also known as Antichristos, the instead of Christ, the in place of Christ. That's what the word literally means in the Greek. He's a counterfeit Christ. He is the ultimate false Christ. Jesus Christ has been chosen, has been selected by God to rule and reign. He is the anointed one. That is what Christ means. He is the anointed one to be king. And in this passage, we read about that world ruler who will seek to place himself in the stead of Jesus Christ. Now that takes me to the second slide. <clears throat> and before I read that, I'd like to read a couple of other verses in, in Daniel chapter 7. First of all, let me read for you verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. He is a braggart. He is an egomaniac. He worships himself. He seeks the worship of others. Also, look at verses 19 to 22. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, and the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. And then also chapter 7 and verse 25. 
Speaking of the little horn, he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. And that, that phrase is a specific reference to the second half of Daniel 77 that lasts exactly three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months, or as in this passage, time, times, and half a time. All right, let's look at Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Now, in the vision that he has, he sees God the Father in the vision. That's the Ancient of Days. And then he sees God the Son coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed." This is a description of Jesus Christ receiving from the Father the authority to rule and reign on the earth in His Messianic kingdom. The setting is the end of the age. And this phrase, Son of Man, is a thoroughly Messianic title in an eschatological context. Now, before we leave Daniel 7, I also want you to notice verses, uh, verses 22 and 27. Let me read verse 22 a second time. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. So the saints will come under persecution, but ultimately they will take possession of a kingdom which will be ruled and reigned by none other than Jesus Christ himself. And then also, verse 27, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. That is what has been predicted by God Almighty in His Holy Word. He lays out for us the end from the beginning because He knows the end from the beginning. And while there are difficult times which lie ahead, we can have confidence, we can have assurance that, that God will ultimately accomplish His purposes and Jesus Christ will ultimately triumph over evil. And he will do so as the Son of Man when he comes with glory and power in the clouds of heaven. So we're still in the introduction, and let's shift from Daniel chapter 7 to the Gospels and some references that Jesus uses concerning himself in relation to this messianic use of the title Son of Man. Now I will acknowledge to you before we go any further, there are references where Son of Man does refer to Jesus' humanity, and, and in, in particular to His first coming. In fact, the f very first reference to Jesus using the Son of Man is in Matthew chapter 8, uh, where he, he said something like the following, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has, has no place to lay his head. It, it, in his first coming, Jesus Christ did not own property. He did not have his own house. He had to sleep in other people's homes, or he had to sleep wherever he could sleep. Sometimes he slept outside. Sometimes he slept in a boat. But as the Son of Man in His first coming, it was humble. And He came in order to die and be buried and rise again. But 
Bear in mind, whenever you see that title, Son of Man, in addition to emphasizing his humanity, it also emphasizes the fact that he is a glorious messianic ruler who will ultimately defeat evil and establish his kingdom upon the earth. Look at what he says in Matthew 24 and, and Luke 17. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what is he saying? When he comes, he will come quickly. Some, some people talk about the soon return of Jesus Christ. This passage is not, is not emphasizing that he's coming soon with reference to time. It's emphasizing that when he comes, he will come quickly. It will be in a moment. It will be sudden. There will be no time to prepare for the coming once he comes because it will be in a split second as lightning flashes from the east to the west. That is what is being emphasized, not only in chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, but a, a major uh, passage in Luke 17, uh, some of which we'll actually be looking at throughout this message uh, that our brother Charles read from the English Standard Version this morning. And, and by the way, I didn't know he was going to be reading from the English Standard Version. And guess which version I'm reading from, Charles? The ESV. And my wife and I, we did the, uh, what was the, Ancestry.com? Is that the name of it? And came to discover, lo and behold, we got lots of English and Irish and Scottish blood <laughs> coursing through our veins. All right. Luke 20, uh, four, uh, 17, 24 says the same thing. For just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in His day. It's a sudden appearance. When He comes, He will come quickly. His coming will transpire. It will take place like the flash of lightning. And by the way, it will be visible. And it will be public. And I will demonstrate that to you as, as we continue. Here are the three references from the three passages that are sometimes referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And all three of them have this sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds that points back to Daniel chapter 7 and is in response to the question that the disciples asked and I'll read for you Matthew's account. Matthew chapter 24. Let me read for you verse 3. <clears throat> As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the close of the age? In other words, when will the temple be destroyed? When will Jerusalem be attacked? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And as you read through the Olivet Discourse, there's, there's only one place where he gives the sign of his coming. And it's in these passages that I have for you right here. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, just prior to verse 30 in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus speaks about the cosmic disturbances sign of Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 31, that Joel predicts will take place. It's a visible sign in the, you know, in the, in the heavens that will take place. It's, it's supernatural. It's not a natural event. It's not an eclipse. It's a supernatural event where things happen to the sun, the moon, and the stars at the same time. And it will be visible from planet Earth. And this will be a sign from God. And Joel tells us in Joel 2, 30 to 31, that this is a sign that will take place 
prior to the great and awesome day of the Lord. So in the context of that great and awesome day of the Lord precessor, Jesus talks about the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the sky. Now, I believe, and this is my opinion, and people can disagree with me if they wish, but if there's disagreement, it should be as a result of study of the Word of God and the authority of the Word of God. My understanding of, the, of God's Word is that when Jesus returns, He returns on the very same day that the day of the Lord begins. Jesus returns for us in the air, we are, we are raptured, we meet Him in the air, and then the day of the Lord begins. In this passage, the day of the Lord hasn't begun yet. In Matthew 24. Hasn't even started. Cosmic disturbances just took place. So, when the Son of Man comes on the clouds in, in glory, it's going to be a public event. And that the reason that it's a public event, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Well, why are they mourning? They're mourning because God is coming back for His people. God is coming back for His elect. And those that aren't caught up mourn because they recognize and understand what is happening. And it says, all the tribes of the earth. Now, it's not every person on planet earth because there are believers that are caught up. But all the tribes of the earth are represented of those who mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. A public event. Now, this word glory is an interesting word. And it has in it the sense of uh, kingly majesty. It's a kingly majesty in the sense of the absolute perfection of God. Some of you may be familiar with uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, where the author of Hebrews, in describing the Son of God, Jesus Christ, declares that Jesus Christ is the radiance of God's glory. Remember that verse? That's what's in view here. The sign of the Son of Man, He will be displaying His glory to the entire world when He comes back with power and glory. It will be a public display. It will be magnificent. It will be incredible. And even those that don't know Him will understand and recognize that this is not a natural occurrence. It is supernatural in nature. All right. Still in the introduction. But we're making progress. But of that day and hour, no one knows. He's talking about his second coming. He's talking about his parousia. His, he's talking about his arrival. Some, some, some call it his return to the earth. Parousia literally means arrival. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking, marrying. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. The flood came and destroyed them all. Now, various interpretations of this, and I, I don't want to get lost in the weeds of, of, of interpretation. I simply, I, I don't have the time. But let me share with you, let me share with, with you something to consider when you look at this passage. It'll be just like the days of Noah. Eating, drinking, giving, and marriage. Different interpretations for that. Okay? Here's what I want you to take away from this passage. What was Noah doing 
in the decades leading up to the flood. He was building an ark, right? What else was he doing? He was preaching. He was preaching repentance to an ungodly world. And what was that ungodly world doing? They were ignoring him. His warning of judgment went unheeded until it was too late. It's going to be just like that when Jesus Christ begins, or excuse Jesus Christ returns and the day of the Lord begins. That judgment will come like sudden destruction. 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us. They're saying peace and safety and sudden destruction comes upon them when the day of the Lord happens. It'll be too late. Same thing with the days of Lot. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Rodham, from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. When Jesus Christ returns in the clouds with glory, it'll be just like the days of Lot. Well, what was happening in the days of Lot? Well, there were men in Sodom that wanted to have relations with angels. Remember that? They were struck blind, and they, you know, that didn't deter them. And the angels rescued Lot and his family, and all but Lot's wife were safely rescued. By the way, this passage in Luke 17, it actually says, it actually spells it out. Jesus warns us, remember Lot's wife. When you think about the second coming of Jesus Christ, remember Lot's wife. Remember her. Don't follow her example. It will lead to destruction. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert, would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not think he will. Now, I've been giving this a lot of thought. I'm going to share some things that won't be received by everyone who hears my words. But I I just want you to think about this. When Jesus talks about he's coming at an hour that we're not expecting or anticipating, it may be more than simply a reference to the chronology of time. I'm I'm just making a suggestion here. Now, if you want to make comments regarding this suggestion, I suggest, you know, since Pastor Steve is out of the country, that you send all of your inquiries to John Haller Esquire. (laughs) I really appreciate John. In his ministry, as well as Pastor Steve's, and they—they they truly are watchmen on the wall. All right. This is the last passage of the second introduction. By the way, this is when he's going through those illegal trials. Remember, there were three uh, Roman trials and three Jewish trials. And um, this is before the high priest. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. In other words, I am the Son of God. Nevertheless, I tell you, 
Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. This is Jesus Christ in front of the religious leaders of the Jews who are demanding that he identify himself, and he identifies himself. He identifies himself as the Messianic Son of Man, God in the flesh. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He deserves death. Now, it's not blasphemy if it's true. And they rejected his identity, and they refused to believe. And as a result, he had to pronounce woes upon them in Matthew chapter 23. Because this is the same group that had committed the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit of God back in Matthew chapter 12. Which is why Jesus began to teach in parables so that he could hide truth from the unbelieving Jews and reveal truth to his own followers who were willing to acknowledge him. All right. So, time for us to shift gears. I'm halfway through my slides. That, you know, those, those first nine slides, that, you know, that was an introduction. We need to shift gears, and we need to kind of take a deep breath. I need to take a drink of water. And I imagine that there might be some of you, or perhaps only even one of you, that's asking. We know that the Son of Man is coming on the clouds with great glory, but how should that great truth impact our lives as we await his return. Well, if you're asking that question in your mind, I want to thank you for asking it because I'm going to answer it or at least attempt to right now. I believe there's three things, three things that God wants us to remember about Jesus Christ being the Son of Man who will come in glory to reign in his kingdom. Who is the Son of Man? Well, Jesus Christ addressed that issue in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 16. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter's declaration is truth that came directly from God the Father. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus went on to say, And upon this rock, or upon this declaration of truth, I will build my church. He's going to build his church on the truth that the Christ, the Son of the living God, is one and the same with the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They are one in the same person. And it is on that truth of Jesus' identity that the church of Jesus Christ is being built Today, we need to know who He is. He is the Christ, the Anointed One, the Chosen One to rule and reign in the Messianic Kingdom. He is the New Testament counterpart of the Old Testament Messiah. Messiah and Christ, they both mean the same thing. And he is the Son of Man. Now, in this same same context, look at what Jesus begins to reveal once they come to know, once they come to know, once it's revealed by God the Father through Peter who Jesus Christ is, look at what Jesus begins to tell them. From that time, underline that phrase in your Bibles. 
It occurs twice, twice in the Gospel of Matthew. Once here in, in chapter 16, and I believe the other one is either in chapter 3 or in chapter 4, when, uh, uh, when Jesus began uh, his, his ministry of uh, preaching repentance. From that time, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here at Caesarea Philippi, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. His death and subsequent resurrection are being predicted based upon his identity as the coming Son of Man, the Messianic Son of Man, who in point of fact is the Christ, the Son of Man of the living God. Verses 27 and 28, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of the Father with His angels and will then repay every man according to His deeds. He'll come as judge as well. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And that's a prediction to the transfiguration. There's a chapter break here. It's unfortunate. You know, Chapter breaks are not inspired. The very next verse says that some days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to a mountain. And Peter, James, and John got a preview of Jesus Christ in His glory when He comes in His glory to establish His kingdom. They got a sneak preview. That's what that verse is talking about. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Now here's my point. When we think about the Son of Man, we should think about His death, burial, and resurrection. We should think about when Jesus comes back in His glory, He's coming back in His glory for people who have responded to the Gospel, who have repented of their sins and placed their faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, namely His death, burial, and resurrection. We think second coming, we ought to also be thinking the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the first point. And that's affirmed in these next two slides that I'm going to share with you. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. And then, One of my favorite passages in the entire Bible, and this is the only slide, I believe, in which uh, I I used a a passage that doesn't actually contain uh, Son of Man, at least up to this point. Uh, There's a couple in Revelation, if we get to it, that uh, also don't. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So because he was obedient to death, because he went to the cross, God has highly exalted him. Revelation 12 tells us, <clears throat> a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, on her head a crown of stars, 12 stars, and she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and pain to give birth. This is talking about Israel and talking about the incarnation and the birth of Jesus Christ. Then the next two verses, talking about the dragon or Satan, his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Remember when Satan tried to use Herod to kill the baby Jesus? Remember that story? Yeah. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That is why he came. He came because he's the messianic son of man. He came because he ultimately is going to rule. Now, put you on your theological thinking caps here for a moment. This passage is describing for us Jesus ascending into heaven. 
her child was caught up to God in his throne. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, he was exalted by the, fa- by the Father at his ascension. And he was given a name which is above every name. And he was given that name because he was willing to become obedient to death, even death on a cross, and fulfill the Father's plan. Every effort on the part of Satan up to this point was to try to prevent Jesus Christ from ascending to heaven as the one who is now qualified and who has now uh, been declared God's choice and God's ruler in the coming kingdom. Satan at Christ's first com- coming, tried to prevent Jesus Christ from ascending to heaven. But at, it, at his second coming, Satan will do everything in his power to prevent Jesus Christ from descending to the earth, including an all-out blitz upon the chosen people of God, the Jews. If he could wipe them out down to the last person, Jesus can't come back if we understand Hosea 5.15 correctly. All right, a second thing. That first thing, we need to focus on the gospel when we think about the second coming of Christ and the Son of Man coming. second thing that we need to focus on is, is the reality, and this is... This is, these are difficult words. The reality that difficult times are coming for believers. This is at the end of a parable. Jesus talks about the kingdom of God in the, in the last half of Luke 17. Charles read a portion of that passage in our scripture reading before the message. We've looked at some of the verses in that passage. Jesus is talking about the very things that he talks about in the Olivet Discourse a little later on. This is prior to his arrival in Jerusalem in Luke 17. Chapter 18, he begins to teach them a parable on on being committed to prayer and not losing heart. But it's in the context of his teaching on the kingdom of God and his coming as the Son of Man in power and great glory. And look at what he says at the end of that parable. You know, the parable of the widow and the unrighteous judge? Remember that parable? He says, I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. But then he asked this question, and it seems so far out of place when you look at it in the context of only the parable. But when you look at it in the context of Luke 17, it makes perfect sense. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus said, I will be persecuted, I will suffer, I will die. He also said some of his followers would face death and face martyrdom. The Bible clearly declares that every single person on planet earth that desires to live a godly Christian life, every single Christian that wants to honor Jesus Christ with their life, the Bible promises, promises us that they will be persecuted. Some of the last words the Apostle Paul ever wrote, literally weeks before his execution, when he wrote the book of 2 Timothy, tells Timothy, come quickly. I'm about ready to be poured out as a drink offering. And he wrote in chapter 3 and verse 12 of that book, I believe it is, and indeed, everyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. When we think of the coming Son of Man in great glory, we need to remember that as we await Him, we're going to be targeted by the world. They hated him, they're going to hate us. They persecuted him, they're going to persecute us. 
They have put some of his followers to death through the ages. And we have modern day examples of that around the world, do we not? My point is, whatever God calls you to face, face it with the knowledge and understanding that it's in light of the coming glory of Jesus Christ as the Son of Man to establish His kingdom. You remember the words of the Apostle Paul? No matter what we have to go through in this life, it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that we will experience in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not worthy. Now, it's, it's sobering. You know, it's not... You know, I don't expect people to, you know, jump up and down and wave their arms and throw confetti and blow party horns. Hey, we're going to suffer for Christ. But it's part of the message. Jesus warned us in advance. His apostles warned us in advance in order that we might be ready. Third thing. John chapter 13, 31 to 35. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now, this, it, now is the Son of Man glorified. By the way, this is uh, upper room discourse. Okay? Judas has just left. He's just left in order to get the Roman soldiers so that he could betray him with a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus is now speaking to the eleven. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. Isn't that interesting? And God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and will glorify Him immediately. Little children, I'm with you a little while longer. You will seek Me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I'm going you can't come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples or followers if you have love for one another. The coming Son of Man, that's the context. What does He want us to do? He wants us to love one another even as Christ loved us. When we think about the coming Messianic Son of Man, coming in the clouds in great power and glory, in majesty, we need to be reminded of the Gospel. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again in order that those who repent of their sin and believe might receive forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. Second, it's going to be difficult days leading up to the return of the Son of Man, prompting Jesus to ask, Will the Son of Man find the faith on the earth? In other words, will those who claim to have faith be faithful to the very end? And then third, a new commandment. We have the law of Christ. We're, not, we're no longer under the law of Moses. We're under the law of Christ. The law of Christ. And this, this is perhaps one of the best expressions of the law of Christ found anywhere in the New Testament. That we love one another even as Christ has loved us. Messianic Son of Man. When you see that phrase, I trust you'll think more than the fact that Jesus Christ took on human flesh more than the fact that Jesus became a man, that he became the God-man, and he's going to return as the God-man when he reveals himself in the sky, coming on the clouds with power and great glory as the Son of Man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Um, I want to pray for any that don't yet know you, Father, that they might turn from their sin and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Father, for those of, of us that do know your Son, I pray that we will live for him, live in light of his coming glory in the clouds, 
when he returns as the Son of Man. Father, may, may we live in light of that day, and may we take heart in light of that truth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.